Hey folks, in this video, I want to give a specific example of a ring. I'll talk about the ring of Gaussian integers in this video. So remember that a set R is a ring if it is equipped with um, addition and multiplication. And we need to be associative under both of those operations. We need to be commutative under addition, but not necessarily under multiplication. So for example, uh, matrices form a ring, but matrix multiplication isn't computed, commutative. You need to have an additive identity, zero, such that if you add zero to anything, you don't change it. And you need to have additive inverses. You don't necessarily need to have multiplicative inverses, however. And you have to satisfy this uh, distributivity property that we now have to write out twice. Um, just because we haven't assumed that multiplication is commutative. So the distributivity property tells you how addition and multiplication relate. So in other words, a ring is an abelian group under addition that also has an associative multiplication that distributes over addition. By contrast, a field had more properties. So a field was an abelian group under addition that Furthermore, the uh, multiplication, when you restricted it to the collection of non-zero elements, was also an abelian group. Okay, But that's not needed in rings. In rings, we don't need multiplicative inverses, for example. All right, so next we'll move to a particular ring, the ring of Gaussian integers, and I'll describe some of its properties. So, the Gaussian integers are um, complex numbers, but they're complex numbers a plus bi, where both a and b are integers. All right? So it's just a subset of the complex plane. And, and we can draw the Gaussian integers. It looks like this grid in the complex plane. So let me give us a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. Now, the, the Gaussian integers are just all of these dots in the complex plane, you know, that, that live on this integer lattice where both the real part and the imaginary part are integers. You know, the real part can certainly be negative, as can the imaginary part. And these dots just extend off forever in all directions. All right. So let's label some of these points. This is 0, 1, 2, 3. Here we have i. i squared is equal to negative 1. And we have 2i. We have 3i. We have negative i. Um, negative 2i. Negative 1. Negative 2. So those are, you know, the purely real one, um, Gaussian integers and the purely imaginary Gaussian integers. But you also have Gaussian integers that are of the form 1 plus i, or 2 plus i, 3 plus i, and um, 1 plus 2i, 2, 2 plus 2i, 2 3 plus 2i, etc. 1 plus 3i, 2 plus 3i, and 3 plus 3i. Okay. Now, you can sort of think of these Gaussian integers as vectors, right? You know, each Gaussian integer defines a vector from the origin. And when you add Gaussian integers, you should just visualize, um, you know, a vector addition. So let's say I want to add 2 plus i to um, 1 plus 2i. Well, I just draw this parallelogram here. And I see that um, 2 plus i, if I add that to 1 plus 2i, I get 3 plus 3i. And this parallelogram actually shows me why addition is commutative. Because if I added them in the other order, first doing 1 plus 2i, and then adding 2 plus i, I still get to the same place, 3 plus 3i. OK? When you um, multiply, it's just standard complex multiplication. So let's try multiplying 2 plus i times 1 plus 2i. So let's take 2 plus i 
multiply it by one plus two i. And this is just first outer inner last. I get two times one, which is two, plus two times two i, that's four i, plus i times one, which is i, and then plus i times two i, which is plus two i squared. Two i squared is the same as negative two. So this two and this negative two cancel, and I just get five i. So when I multiply, Um, those two vectors. As output, I just get this vector or Gaussian integer here, which is 5i. And this behaves as, as you expect complex multiplication to behave, right? When you uh, multiply complex vectors, the angle from horizontal, those angles add. Okay, so I multiply those two vectors to get this one. All right. Not every Gaussian integer has a multiplicative inverse, right? So that's how we know that we're not, we're not in a field. In a field, every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. But in, in these Gaussian integers, um, the vast majority of the Gaussian integers don't have multiplicative inverses. All right, what are the elements that do have multiplicative inverses? So one, negative one, i, and negative i, these are the only Gaussian integers with multiplicative inverses. First, let's see why each of these has multiplicative inverses. Well, one times one is one. So one is its own multiplicative inverse. And similarly, negative one times negative one is one. So negative one is its own multiplicative inverse. I should say, this is a ring with unit or with identity. One is clearly the multiplicative identity because any number times one is just equal to itself. And then if you do i times negative i, you get negative i squared, which is equal to negative times negative one or one. So i and negative i are their own Gaussian integers. Zero has no multiplicative inverse just because zero times anything is equal to zero. Now, let me give you an argument quickly why these are the only Gaussian integers that have multiplicative inverses, okay? To do that, we'll, we'll use some geometric intuition. We'll define the norm of a Gaussian integer as a squared plus b squared, okay? So look at, look at um, this Gaussian integer two plus i. a is two, b is one, right? What is the length of this? The length of this vector is the square root of a squared plus b squared, just by the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem. If this is a, if this is b, since we have a right triangle, the length of the hypotenuse is the square root of a squared plus b squared. So this is just the square of the length of the vector corresponding to a Gaussian integer. The way complex multiplication works it turns out that if I have two Gaussian integers, a plus bi and c plus di, and if I multiply them uh, together, the norm of the product is gonna equal the product of the norms. So this is gonna equal the norm of a plus bi times the norm of c plus di. Let's, <clears throat> let's very quickly show you why this is true. Okay, so the norm of a plus bi times c plus di, well, let's just multiply that out. So what is a plus bi times c plus di? The, the real part is going to be a times b, a times c minus, because i squared is negative one, minus b times d, okay? 
So this is going to have as real part AC minus BD. And then how many copies of I do I have? I have BC plus AD. Maybe I'll write that as AD plus BC. All right. So now I'm taking the norm of a Gaussian integer where this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. So I know how to take the norm. I just square each of those and add them together. So this is AC minus BD squared plus AD plus BC squared by this definition of the norm. AC minus BD squared gives me A squared C squared minus 2ABCD coming from the cross term plus B squared D squared. And then when I square this bit, I get plus A squared D squared plus 2ABCD coming from the cross term plus B squared C squared. Cancellation happens. Minus 2ABCD cancels with 2ABCD. And I obtain a squared c squared plus b squared d squared plus a squared d squared plus b squared c squared. And this is just equal to a squared plus b squared times c squared plus d squared. Because when I multiply this out, I get the a squared c squared. I get the a squared d squared, I get the b squared c squared, and the b squared d squared. And this is just the norm of my first Gaussian integer times the norm of my second Gaussian integer. Okay, why is this valuable for us? So, um, We've already observed that zero does not have a multiplicative inverse. And we've observed that one, negative one, i, and negative y do have multiplicative inverses, okay? Let's consider any other Gaussian integer. So any other Gaussian integer is not gonna be in this diamond here, okay? And we're gonna prove that any other Gaussian integer that's not one of these, one, negative one, i, negative i, or zero, it can't have a multiplicative inverse. The reason is, if you had any other Gaussian integer, a plus b i, that was outside this diamond, the norm is going to be at least two, okay? So this norm is going to be at least two. For example, the norm of one plus i is one squared plus one squared, which is two. Pretend that C plus DI was an alleged multiplicative inverse. So we're supposing for a contradiction that we had a multiplicative inverse. That would mean that we're assuming that A plus BI plus C plus C, <laughs> if, if these were multiplicative inverses, then A plus BI times C plus DI would equal one. So we'd be looking here we'd be looking here at the norm of one, which is just one. All right. Now the norm is always an integer. The norm of a Gaussian integer is a sum of squares of integers. So it's always an integer. Can we find an integer so that one is equal to something greater than or equal to two times an integer? No. This, this bit right here would have to be less than or equal to one half. But, but that's a contradiction, just because every Gaussian integer has to have an integer norm, right? And, and you know, to, to have um, a norm that's at least two times another norm equaling one, well, this would have to be a, a non-zero norm that's at most one half, and there's no integer that's uh, non-zero or, or that's, um, you know, that's uh, not zero, but uh, there's no positive, there's no uh, non-negative integer, positive integer that's 
bigger, non zero, but also less than or equal to one half. Okay, so I went into a little bit of detail at the end there, but in any case, the Gaussian integers are an important ring to keep in mind. You can add Gaussian integers, you can multiply Gaussian integers, um, you, you satisfy the distributive property, and you have multiplicative inverses for a couple of elements, one, negative one, i, negative i, but you don't have mul multiplicative inverses for any other Gaussian integers. All right, thanks so much.